Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to this week's study. As we come before the Heavenly Father, as we look to understand that which we are seeing in the development of the thought process that Uriah Smith had used in his articles on Daniel, shall we give our Heavenly Father praise, come before him in prayer, and ask for his guidance and his direction so that we might more clearly understand the points that we will need to understand for this time in earth's history. Shall we now come before the throne of grace and thank him for all the blessings that he has provided? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, your glory and your majesty is amazing. The way in which you lead us is unfathomable. We thank you now for the blessings that you are providing. We ask for your continued grace. We ask that you will show us that which we need to understand at this time in our history. Direct us now. May your spirit enlighten our minds. May your angels attend us. May your will be done. Help us in these conversations. Help us in these studies. Bring to mind remembrance of that which we need. Direct us now, for this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we were coming to verse 10 yesterday. As verse 10 reads, But his son shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come, and overflow, and pass through. Then shall he return, and be stirred up, even unto his fortress. The first part of this verse speaks of sons in the plural. The last part of one in singular. The sons of Seleucus Callinicus were Seleucus Seranius and Antiochus Magnus. These both entered with zeal upon the work of vindicating and avenging the cause of their father and their country. The elder of these, Seleucus, first took the throne. He assembled a great multitude to recover his father's dominions. But being a weak and pusillanimous prince, both in body and estate, destitute of money and unable to keep his army in obedience, he was poisoned by two of his generals after an inglorious reign of two or three years. His more capable brother, Magnus, was thereupon proclaimed king, who, taking charge of the army, retook Seleucia and recovered Syria, making himself master of some places by treaty and others by force of arms. A truce followed, wherein both sides treated for peace yet prepared for war, after which Antiochus returned and overcame in battle Nicholas, the Egyptian general, and had thoughts of invading Egypt itself. Here is the one who should certainly overthrow and pass through. Now, is there anything that we're seeing here that would relate to present truth? Well, I mean, obviously, we look at the overflow and pass through, and that becomes a symbol of the Sunday law. Right. Right. So that now so we had actually um taken this in our present application, which I don't think we really need to look at in detail, but um that this is uh, representing the United States apostate Protestantism or and Republicanism, the church state relation. I'm trying to think of so he stirs up the assembly of great multitude. Okay, raise a large army. One son, Titus the third. So that's going to be in Titus Magus. Um, so that starts the fourth Syrian war, which we're we're equating to the Sunday Law as a type. And then we have return to Syria, which is the kingdom of the north. So the idea that we have here is that this is going to represent uh, republicanism taking over again the U.S. and bringing in the Sunday law, basically. And and I don't see any problem with his interpretation here. You know, we still have the, the interesting thing regarding the fact that um, we have uh, Syria being the king of the north, which he hasn't really explained why that is, like why we have the north against the south. He hasn't explained that. I know we dealt, dealt, dealt with it quite a bit yesterday, but I'm still fascinated by it. So... Uh, Let's think about this a little bit. So if we're going to make this parallel, so we have this kingdom that's divided towards the four winds of heaven, Alexander's kingdom. How do we relate that 
So Greece represents the world, right? Right. Okay. Now, Israel represents God's people, correct? Correct. Okay. And we see that the world is divided towards these the, the four winds. Now, we know that there are going to be four horns in, in Daniel chapter 8 when that great horn is broken. Um, so it was divided between the four winds. You know, we should kind of look back at that chapter 8 again. So it says, um, when he, the goat, that's verse 8, so Daniel 8, 8. Therefore, when the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So we know that these are these, these four kingdoms, uh, Seleucus, Lysimachus, Cassander, and Ptolemy, right? These are the, the leaders of these four different parts. Now, Uriah Smith has said that the eastern kingdom is Seleucus and the southern kingdom Ptolemy. We have no problem. But he, he's, it's inexplicable how this becomes the king of the north. That is, I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that Seleucus conquers the king of the north, and that's why he's the king of the north. But it's, it's implied. But the question is, why is, since Seleucus is in the kingdom of the east and Syria is in the east, why does Syria become the, the focal point of whoever has Syria is the king of the north, right? That, that's the problem. Right. Okay. Now, then when we look at Daniel chapter 8, um, and one of them came, and out of one of them, that's out of the one of the one of the four winds, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So, obviously, that has to be from the north, right? All right. Because it's not going towards the north, right? So it must be the king of the north. It's going to go south, east, and west. Right, so that's Syria. So he doesn't connect that there. He doesn't explain why, the, because here it seems that Syria is the king of the north, even though, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I mean, the king of the north wouldn't be Syria if yeah. Syria is the king of the east. Correct. Is, is that clear to everyone? Yeah, so, um, but yet, we know that this is the king of the north that's being described. So, so the king of the north isn't Syria. In if if we take what Uriah Smith says, the king of the north he says is is the area north of Israel, which is um, at the Hellespont and the Bosphorus, right? That territory, which when we looked at this map, you know what we actually have to the north of Israel is Syria. Right. Okay. So, so since Syria is to the north of Israel, Syria should be the kingdom of the north, and and so it would. So I think he's wrong there. So they, we have these kingdoms towards the four winds of heaven, but I don't think you can label them the king of the north, the king of the south, the king of the east, the king of the west. Syria is the king of the north. It's going to have the territory to the east. Right. It, it is um, the king of the north is going to conquer then these other territories and even is going to um, uh, let me see how did it work this here. Right. So so once you have the king of the north, it's going to go towards these different directions, east, west. And like towards the south, towards the east and towards the pleasant land. So, so the south is Ptolemy, the east, that's, that's, that's not really the territory of Syria. That's going to be um, all of the stuff east of Palestine. So, so these four kingdoms, even though they go, they go towards the four winds of heaven, aren't the king of the north, the king of the south, the king of the east, the king of the west, as he does. Um, so he's missing something there. Now, how that applies then if we're going to make this app 
application in in our time how do we how do we make this this application with Greece being divided in this way? Is there any way that we can say that the world is divided towards the four winds of heaven that where, where do we place that historically in a present truth application? I don't know if we really addressed it. Right. I'm looking back at our notes because what we have is that Alexander the Great is going to represent the Soviet Union. So if we think about this, we, we know that um, the Soviet Union is is going to be this power that we would call uh, the King of the South, right? So that, that goes back to verse 3. The mighty King Alexander the Great shall stand up. We put Alexander Great represents the Soviet Union. He shall do according to his will, conquer vast territory. And, and we see that each of these kingdoms uh, have their time in which they do according to their will, right? Right, correct. So now we're, we're saying we parallel that to the Soviet-Afghan war. So our application of how we have made this a present truth application is quite different than um, was done by FFA, right? So they're going to say Alexander the Great is Trump. But we said, well, that doesn't make sense because it's the globalists. Now, and that is the globalists, when the Soviet Union collapses, the globalists then uh, are divided, right? Correct. That, that territory is, and, and what's going to end up happening is that the king of the South is going to be the UN, right? That is the globalists in that, in that context. So we have the Soviet-Afghan War, um, and when he shall stand up, that is at the height of his power, that's going to be November 9th, 1989. Not necessarily at the height of his power, but that's what we have. It's just at a point he stands up, but his kingdom shall be broken. And, and, and that's going to be the death of Alexander, but we're going to mark that as December 25th, 1991. And shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. So there's the four Hellenistic empires, that is globalism in the modern context and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion in which he ruled so his former kingdom would not be under one ruler so we see it's divided so so it goes from the soviet union it goes to the un so it goes to the whole world and for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those right so you've got these four former generals who went through that ptolemy cassandra the Seleucus, and the Seleucus. So this is the UN. So the king of the south, that is this, this spiritual power, the UN, the globalists, shall be strong. And one of his princes, Lucas I Nicanor, that is the US, is, as we have him. And Seleucus I, or he's Seleucus I, the USA, shall be strong above him. That is, the United States is going to be stronger than the UN and have dominion, gain the territory of Syria, which is, we're saying, is the global economy. His dominion shall be great, dominion, largest territory of the Hellenistic empires. He's going to control the trade routes. In the end of years, after the first and second Syria's, Syrian wars, 9-11 is an empowerment of the first angel. I know it's probably hard to follow me reading this here without you seeing it. They, Ptolemy, the second Philadelphia, and Antiochus, the first Soter, shall gain, shall join themselves together include peace, and we're going to say that that's 9-11. So the United States and the Pope are going to conquer the USSR. The USSR then uh, is divided, but the globalists still exist, right? It comes, correct. you know, right? So they're, they're still going to exist, even though the Soviet Union was destroyed. And uh, the United States is going to gain this power. They they, they they win the Cold War, you know, as well, right? That's how we would look at it. But um, at 9-11, the UN ends up coming and asserting itself. Now, where, where this battleground moves to, so if we're going to talk about Syria, that battleground is the U.S. Does that make sense? Right? Because that's where the king of the north and the king of the south are really fighting over, is they're fighting over Syria. 
Right. But the king of the south, when it, when it occupies Syria, it's not the king of the north. No, because then wouldn't it have been the king of the east? Well, yeah, but it, Syria is really to the north. It, it represents the king. I think he's wrong in saying that it's the east. Because Syria is really to the north. I mean, you could say it's to the northeast a little bit, but the way that you come down into Israel is from the north. And, and the map I have clearly has Syria in the north. You know, maybe it's not the best map, but it is in the north. Ammon is to the east. And, you know, Edom, Moab, and Ammon are to the east. Hmm. Yeah, so I think there is a flaw there that we've never, you know, never really addressed. So, so they're going to be fighting over that territory. And, and Egypt does occupy that territory, at least parts of it, at different times. So that's the territory they're fighting over. So is this a battle for control of the United States? Is that really what's happening with the king of the north and the king of the south? But there's, there's two more philosophical powers battling over the U.S., control of the U.S., which controls the global economy. You know, how, how would we look at that? Well, is it in control of the global economy or is it just in control of the, the hearts and minds of men and women? No, it's about the economy because that's really what the Sunday law is about. Okay. So remember, you, I mean, obviously some people are going to be on the side of it. They're going to receive the mark of the beast on the forehead, but some receive the mark of the beast on the hand only, right? And 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 that is the control of of the economy, right? Because you can't buy or sell unless you receive the mark on either your right hand or your forehead. So the the United States, the the what's going on right now with globalism. The United States, globalism really exists because of the U.S., right? The United States has its, its military power allowing for all of this trade. Maybe, maybe what partly happens in this they can't buy or sell is that we have a type of, of, of economic collapse, economic collapse because of what happens with the U.S. and that that then causes this restriction. It's not like that people say, okay, we're going to have a Sunday law and we're going to make it so that, um, you know, people can't buy or sell. Like it, it's, it's almost more that somebody must be the cause of what's happening. But also there's just the necessity of restricting the economy, that the economy has collapsed because the United States is no longer in control. Yeah. So, um, and Kelly made a comment there. Yeah. So the U.S. dollar is the one currency coveted by almost every other country. Now, there is some idea that that might change, or it has a change. This changed when Reagan got. No, Reagan had nothing to do with with America on the gold standard. That was Nixon. Yeah. So this is yeah. That's what I thought. But 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 there is talk that. The United States may not be uh, the currency of choice that it is the global currency at some point. I don't know how correct they are, but it could be that, you know, as globalism fractures, like there might even be a way in which that, that fractures further. But I, I do know that, that there, is, there is this battle over the, the, the economy. And, and I think the United States will still be the one that, that controls that economy, but it's going to be with a glow, with an economic collapse. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's something I have to think about. But but I think Uriah Smith is wrong. That we've we've looked at this incorrectly with the historical application of why we have the King of the North and the King of the South. That those symbols actually exist, not because of Alexander's kingdom dividing towards the four winds of heaven, because that distinction has existed in the past, before that, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Now, we also have Israel exists as the north and the south, right? Correct. So, in the United States, 
we also have the North and the South division. The North is Republican and the South is Democrat, correct? Yes. <clears throat> so, so within the United States, there is a battle going on for the control of the economy. And the question, are the globalists going to control it? Or is this other power, which we call the King of the North, going to control it? And that would be the Republicanism. But it's going to be the Republicanism is apostate Protestantism. And I don't know how you fit that in there with this division of this kingdom, but we know that the Protestants become part of Babylon in Millerite history, right? Agreed. So do Protestants then become the king of the north? That's that's not an angle that I've seen us discuss before. <clears throat> but in a but, in a way, it could fit. Well, it does fit because we we see that the Protestants when they fall, they, be, they become what constitutes Babylon. They you know they have a partial fall in Millerite history. Ellen White says it's a moral fall, and and that would be. Uh, if, if you're dealing with the United States, that's going to be the, the Protestant horn that falls in Millerite history. And our history is going to be the Republican horn that falls, right? Correct. Okay. So, so this makes much more sense. Of, of One of the things that we've argued is that the United States is the king of the north. And that's because the United States is going to combine with the papacy, which the papacy is the king of the north. But the United States became the king of the North in Millerite history, not just in our history. And that's something I don't think we've ever discussed before in this movement. No, we haven't. Yeah. Yeah. So that that alliance between the papacy and the U.S. began in Millerite history with the rejection of the first angel's message. And then it continues and develops until we finally come to the point where the United States will speak as a dragon. That's really when the Republican horn falls, though it, the Sunday law is progressive. Now, now we have said that at 9-11, the UN ends up, that's when you know, they reach the hand across the gulf, or well, well, the abyss. I guess it depends, because Ellen White uses both and switches them. But, um, the United States makes this alliance with the king of the South, that is with spiritualism, a dragon power. And, and we put that at 9-11. So first it made an alliance with Babylon, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, so we can say it's Babylon or the beast, right? And that's going to be 1989 where that shows up. And at 9-11, we, we see that happening. And then we will have this threefold union, which is developing towards the Sunday law. So the United States becomes the power that's foremost in causing this Sunday law to occur, right? I can't remember exactly how Ellen White says it. Uh, I just can't find this here. Okay, so yeah, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of conscience. That's the great controversy, page 588. Okay. So. Now, she's, she's saying that through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. So one is we see that the immortality of the soul connects us with spiritualism and Sunday sacredness with the Roman power, right? With the papacy, right? So it's through these two great eras that this really occurs. Now, of course, that's really on the spiritual level. Now, in, um, let me see here, how's that different? Okay, let's see here. Now, she, she has another statement. So this other one says, the decree of enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. 
when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of spiritualism. So here, she puts gulf and abyss in the same order. She reverses Roman power in spiritualism. This is from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 451. So when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and a Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. So what do we make of that, that she reverses these here? And in this case, she's, she's actually focusing not upon the two great errors, you know, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. She's fo- focusing more upon this uh, decree, right? So is there sort of two different levels in which this is occurring? One more philosophical and one more political? But are they, bo- are, as we're looking at this, aren't they both with the ultimate goal? The same ultimate yeah. goal? Oh, yeah. It's just that she characterizes it two different ways. Right. And, and I can see why in the Great Controversy she addresses it the way that she does compared to in Testimonies for the Church. Because there's a, a, sort of a different context in which uh, she's making this statement. So in the Great Controversy, it was page, page 588. That's going to be chapter 36, and then you're going to have chapter 37, Scriptures to Safeguard, right? So and then you're going to have the chapter, the final warning, 38, and so the mighty angel of revelation coming down in the time of trouble. So here it's dealing more with the kind of the precursor to the Sunday law of all the things that occur, Then she's going to have the close of probation. Yeah, so I don't know. I have to think about it a little bit. But it's always puzzled me why she switched. She has these two different statements where she switches. She has a gulf and abyss, but she switches in great controversy at spiritualism and the Roman power. In five testimonies, it's going to be the Roman power and then spiritualism listed. So she switches which which one is reaching the hand across the abyss and the gulf. Still, still has gulf and abyss in the same order. Those are the two statements she she makes. Five Testimonies, uh, uh, 451, and Great Controversy, 588. Now, 588, just as a symbol, is is an interesting uh, number. Uh, let's see here if I can remember what it is. Um, I believe it's uh, 29 times 12, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so 588 is going to be 49 times 12. Which, which is dealing with a, a jubilee uh, cycle, 12 jubilee cycles. It's 588 years. I'm not going to go into the detail of why, why I know that and how I've applied that before. Okay, so Kelly's got some comments there with Nixon, 1973. Right. Trade oil with the U.S. So it ties it to the petrodollar, I guess they call it. And then Kelly asked, about uh, the former prosperity. They want to return to their former prosperity. Make America great again. Let's see if I can find that. I don't see it anywhere. Doesn't mean it's not there. It's a lot of yeah, I don't I don't think she says that exact wording, but so I don't know. Okay. Anyway, Dwight, we could move on probably from this, but I think it's kind of an interesting point that uh comes from this. So if we're going to go back to uh, verse 10 of Daniel. Okay, just a moment. Or, 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 yeah, verse 10. So Daniel 10.10, 10, or, or Daniel 11.10, pardon me. Right? And then we're going to have the king of the south in verse 11. So okay, coming with caller. Okay. So he stirs up even to his fortress. So that's United States returning to his fortress, right? not the king of the south returning to his fortress. Correct. Okay, which is the constitution. Yes. Okay. Now it's kind of, it's kind of interesting in responding to Kelly's question. Three spirit of prophecy 
here it is written, Corinth <clears throat> was one of the leading cities, not of Greece, but of the world. Situated upon a narrow neck of land between two seas, it commanded the trade of both the east and the west. Its position was almost impregnable. A vast citadel of rock <clears throat> rising abruptly and perpendicularly from the plain to the height of 2,000 feet above the level of the sea was a strong and natural defense to the city and its two seaports. Corinth was now more prosperous than Athens, which had once taken the lead. Both had experienced severe vicissitudes, but the former had risen from her ruins and was far more in advance of her former prosperity while the latter had not reached to her past magnificence. Athens was acknowledged the center of art and learning, Corinth, the seat of government and trade. Now, is this giving us any kind of an indication of an answer for Kelly's question? Well, uh, just that Corinth then would symbolize the economy. Right. So we could make an application there that parallels the United States in that context. Okay. So, but yeah, it doesn't really answer the question because he wants to know where Ellen White talks about the United States seeking to retain, to go to its former prosperity. But um, it just must be a bit different wordings. I looked up former prosperity and I couldn't find the statement. Uh, yeah. Not just in quotation marks, but even individually, like former prosperity, just the words without quotations. There, there's only three such references. One was third spirit of prophecy. The other is life of Paul. 98.2 and the third is letter 397 of 1906. Yeah, they're all the same basic statement regarding Corinth. No. So, so, no, you so, said, one, I'm no, sorry, you so which one is? Letter 397 of, of 1906. What, what does that say? We'll come back to you, William, in just a second. When men refuse to take warning, when counsel is turned from, the judgments of the Lord will come. God is waiting to be acknowledged in the calamities that he sends upon his people. All who return to him with all the heart and humble themselves before the Lord by confession and repentance, he will graciously accept and restore to their former prosperity. God would have the glory of the gospel dispensation appear. In the establishment of his church, the Lord began with one nation, but it was his plan that the transforming power of his grace would spread from nation to nation until all the world, Jew and Gentile alike, could receive the message of his grace. Yeah, so that doesn't really apply. Right. Yeah. Okay, Brother William, your question. Well, I'm going to ask this question about what you just read. Uh, is that important to the United States? No. Okay. The church. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other question was, well, I don't got it. I was going to ask about the uh, Athens. Do, well, we are saying that Athens is uh, represented by the United States. I would, I would think that Athens is more representative of the globalists and Corinth, the United States. That's the way I'd look at this. Yeah, Corinth represents the United States. But in the other statement, it's going to be talking about God's people, the prosperity of, of the church, not of the nation. Okay. Now, from what, what we're considering right now, of these kings that Smith refers to, we have Seleucus III Soter, also called Seleucus Serranus, who ruled from December of 225 to April or June of 223 BC. This king, this son, was not even 20 when he took the throne. He was about 18 years old, and he was then killed when he was 20. Now, the brother that followed him Antiochus III was proclaimed king, but it's interesting that his reign ended 
on the 3rd of July of 187. Now, do we have any symbols that we could use in this situation? So Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, was born in Susa of the Seleucid Empire. He died in Susa. And this was after he had been decisively defeated at the Battle of Magnesia. And that was a battle against Rome. Now, well, we haven't we haven't applied any of that um, in in because I don't think it's directly related to it here in Daniel 11. Okay, but maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. So here in Daniel 11, 11, mm-hmm. we read, and the king of the south shall be moved with Kohler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given unto his hand. Ptolemy Philopater, Ptolemy the father lover, succeeded his father in the kingdom of Egypt, being advanced to the crown not long after Antiochus Magnus, Antiochus the Great, had succeeded his brother in the throne of Syria. He was a most luxurious and vicious prince but was at length roused at the prospect of an invasion of Egypt by Antiochus. He was indeed moved with choler for the losses he had sustained and the danger which threatened him. And he came forth out of Egypt with a numerous army to check the progress of the Syrian king. The king of the north was also to set forth a great multitude. The army of Antiochus, according to Polybius, amounted on this occasion to 62,000 foot, 6,000 horse, and 102 elephants. In the battle, Antiochus was defeated, and his army, according to the prophecy, was given into the hands of the king of the south. 10,000 foot and 3,000 horse were slain, and over 4,000 men were taken prisoners. While of Ptolemy's army, there were slain only 700 horse and about twice that number of infantry. How do we apply this? Well, I don't know if I want to look at all the present truth applications. So, I mean, we know this is the Battle of Raphia. Right? Okay. So, so we we already know how, how we've applied it, but it's going to represent midnight. But I don't know if we want to go through all the present truth applications here. We're just trying to examine the historical application. Does Uriah Smith have this correct or not? Okay. So, so we already understand that. So it's going to be dealing with the Battle of Raphia in 2000, or 217 BC, right? And uh, the date for the Battle of Raphia is so. One is we have the symbol of midnight, 217. So that's the right. 21st of July symbol. Um, but also the date for the Battle of Raphia. Wasn't June 22nd? Yeah, it's going to be June 22nd. And the Battle of Pydna also has that date, June 22nd as well. Now, uh, in June 22nd, of course, um, this is going to be uh, where they have um, in the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Pydna, they're connected to a lunar eclipse as well right okay i remember correctly just trying to see here but um yeah so anyway we got those 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 dates the june 22nd date now so i mean we have made applications of this to what happens with um within our lines right so we are going to have an application of yes yeah, so June 22nd, you're going to have the lunar eclipse, I believe. I know, and then uh, I know you do in the Battle of Pydna. Anyway, that's what I was trying to remember. Yeah, so I think it's just in the Battle of Pydna you have the lunar eclipse, not in the Battle of Raphia. But anyway, they're the same date. Yeah, because the eclipse happens about like 8 o'clock at night, local time, just, just after sunset. About an hour, see one, two, one sets at nine o'clock, and it's going to be or seven o'clock, and it's about nine o'clock when the, the eclipse occurs. Okay, anyway, just me mumbling. Uh, so, 
So we got the Battle of Raftia, yeah. and and so we would agree with the Rise Smith here that there's no problem with this interpretation. Okay. So let's go on. Okay. And when he had taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Ptolemy lacked the prudence to make a good use of his victory. Had he followed up his successes, he probably would have become master of the whole kingdom of Antiochus. But contending himself with a few menaces and a few threats, he made peace that he might be able to give himself up to the uninterrupted and uncontrolled indulgence of his brutal passions. Thus, having conquered his enemies, he was overcome by his vices, and forgetful of the great name which he might have established, he spent his time in feasting and lewdness. His heart was lifted up by his success, but he was far from being strengthened by it, for the inglorious use he made of it caused his own subjects to rebel against him. But the lifting up of his heart was more especially manifested in his transactions with the Jews. Coming to Jerusalem, he there offered sacrifices and was very desirous of entering into the most holy place of the temple, contrary to the law and the religion of that place. But being, though with great difficulty, restrained, he left the place burning with anger against the whole nation of the Jews, and immediately commenced against them a terrible and relentless persecution. In Alexandria, where the Jews had resided since the days of Alexander, and enjoyed the privileges of the most favored citizens, 40,000, according to Eusebius, 60, according to Jerome, were slain in this persecution. The rebellion of the Egyptians and the massacre of the Jews certainly was not calculated to strengthen him in his kingdom, but was sufficient, rather, to almost totally ruin it. Any thoughts? Okay. One of the things that that we, we discussed before. So we know that we have the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Peneum, right? So right. Battle of Peneum is going to be more uh, verse 13. So this is the intervening events that are going to let, let lead to the Battle of Peneum where Ptolemy's kingdom is going to be uh, conquered, right? Right. So the king of the south ultimately loses. Now, one thing that we had never really considered prior to this series of studies was that uh, the Battle of Raphia typifies what happens in 1798, and the Battle of Panium typifies what happens in 1989, right? So uh, so we understand that, right? That's That makes sense to people. Right. The King of the South defeating the King of the North, right? The King of the North defeating the King of the South, which, which I'm, I'm kind of surprised that we never really had considered that before. So when we get to Daniel 11, verse 40, right, we can see that this battle of, like, the literal kingdoms, right, of the king of the north and the king of the south dealing with literal Israel is typifying what happens with God's people at the end of the world, right? So it, make, it makes complete sense. So, so we have these levels of application where we can see that this is typifying something that's going to be showing up later. And, and it occurs within the text itself. We see as we progress through the text, part of the reason that we have this king of the north, king of the south, battling over this territory, you know, which is going to be the land of Palestine and, and Syria and, you know, basically the Levant, right? All of this stuff from the river Euphrates to the river of Egypt, that's the territory that they're basically fighting over, right? Right. Right. So it's not just, you know, is the land of Israel, it's the land of Syria, all of that, that place. That That's where the battleground is. But the king of the north, you know, occupies Syria. Sometimes Egypt does. Like, so Egypt in the battle of, of Raphia, right, Antiochus is going to be defeated. Now, now, we made some application that that's the Great Reset in place equals midnight, right? This is this battle going on. But it's happening on so many different levels that in some ways it's hard to keep track of these applications. That is, we have a broad application of Raphi and Panium, which would be 
the whole, if, if we're going to look at it, it would be zoomed out from Ellen White's perspective of Millerite history and the repeat of Millerite history, right? That that would be Louis F. Weir looking at Daniel 11, verse 40, A and B as being these these two events. He doesn't call 1989, you know, like by name, and he doesn't call it the time of the end as well. But Ellen White does say that Revelation 18, uh, the second angel's message is going to be repeated because we're going to have this complete fall of Protestantism, right? That's why <clears throat> the angel of Revelation 18 comes and says, not just that Babylon has fallen, but also come out of her, my people, which isn't in the original uh in Revelation 14 of the second angel message. It doesn't say come out of her, my people. But in, in chapter 18, it does. Right. So the call to come out of Babylon actually occurs. Now, Millerite history did apply Revelation 18 uh, to the second angel's message and made a call to come out of Babylon. But, but that was, in a sense, you know, incorrect. They were applying Revelation 18 and Revelation 14, the second angel, without understanding a repeat of history, because obviously they believed that Christ was coming soon, right? So they're not going to put Revelation 18 as a repeat, but Ellen White does. So in that really broad spectrum of things, where, you know, the third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844, it continues, then it's going to be joined with the second angel, which means that the first angel must be repeated as well, right? Because if the second angel is repeated, can't have a third without a first and second. So obviously you can't have a second without a first, right? That's why we have 1989 is the time of the end and the first angel's message arriving in our history so that the second angel can arrive in our history, right? That's how we understand it. Right. right. So, it, but that's a zoomed out view. Now, when we zoom in, we then see a more present truth application, right? We, we can say, well, the Battle of Raffi and the Battle of Pania represent midnight and the midnight cry. Now, we've, we've made an application of that within, within our movement, right? Because we can say that, um, you know, midnight is November 9th, 2019, and the midnight cry is July 18, 2020. We've made that application within the movement itself. So that's that's really zoomed into the movement. But zooming out a little bit, and, and sometimes we say, well, it's internal and external, but I think it's more than just that. I think we're actually zooming into, they're not parallel with each other. They're not running at the same time. It's just that we have an application that applies to this movement. And then when we zoom out a bit, there's an application that applies to what's happening within the United States itself. So we have this midnight and midnight cry. So we have, you know, 9-11 becomes the arrival of the second angel's message. And in that application, then we, we're, we're zooming out a little bit, right? That makes sense. So we, so we can zoom out and then we, we, know, we haven't come to midnight yet. Or if we have, we haven't marked it as anything particularly. We're not certain where midnight is. Because even if we take... Uh, January 6, 2021, as, as midnight, well, that would just be an application of it. You know, I, I would think that midnight is still quite a ways distant, I mean, not, like, not saying how many years or anything, but we're not really to that midnight that Jeff initially talked about when we had 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law back in 2016. We haven't really got to that midnight yet. Because that's that's more that that's going to have to be addressing this message is going to have to go out to Adventism in some way in order for the midnight and the midnight cry to happen because that's the midnight cry is paralleling the loud cry, right? In in a way, right? But within Adventism, right? That we're going to have the loud cry. The loud cry is going to happen after the Sunday law. So we even zoom out further and we get the loud cry. So that. This is this is where we when Jeff said, well, we have, you know, 9-11 represents the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. That's really a zoom into the Sunday law within this movement. So 
So we still have to sort some of that out, how we're going to uh, draw those lines. I mean, I have some ideas, but when I'm presenting it to people, like I presented it last Sabbath, to some new people who came to the studies, you know, I had to explain, you know, these levels uh, on the bigger scale, right? I mean, I didn't really address like November 9th and, and so forth, but, but they, could see, they could see how it works. So there's still things that we have to sort out. But there, you know, I paralleled the midnight cry to the loud cry. So I was looking at that sort of more zoomed out, like Ellen White would look at it. But we have zoomed in a bit. And, and that's part of the problem is the movement was zooming in the stuff that was happening within the movement and could never get its focus back out again. So we are expecting all these things to happen as, you know, the ultimate fulfillment of these prophecies of this application. And that didn't make any sense. But just like the Millerites, in a sense, they were zoomed into their history, expecting Christ to return. And so they they became myopic, right? Right. And that's what's happened to this movement, nearsighted, right? Um, so not able to stand back and see the whole picture. And, and so that's the problem that this movement has had. And, and we're now... We're, in a sense, trying to zoom out a bit more. Uh, we still suffer from myopia to some degree. But, but I think, at least while I'm here in Australia and things that are happening here, which I'm going to have to share once, once I get back, I'm actually getting a, a different focus. I'm zooming out a little bit more in what our role is. Because right now we've been focused upon what's happening in the movement internally. And, and I think in some ways we have to drop all of that. The Canadian and American groups just basically, like they're, they're, they're the ones casting us out, so to speak, right? They, they don't really want to have anything to do with us. Um, but it's not about us. It's about what, what God's message is to the world. And so if we start focusing upon you know, the Canadian American group and us as if we're something, because we're not, then we're going to get caught up in that trap that they're caught in, whirlpool, and uh, get sucked down with them. So we need to recognize that God is doing something outside of us, outside of this movement as we see it, because there's a bigger movement that's occurring uh, within Adventism that we are just a part of and we just don't see it yet that makes sense so so i'm going to address it later on once i get back and, and sort of put some of those studies together and can explain it in more detail it's hard to do without uh well also i'm pretty busy here still but anyway does that make kind of make sense i think it gives a good overview yeah okay okay so verse 13 for the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. The events predicted in this verse were to occur after certain years. The peace concluded between Ptolemy, Philopater, and Antiochus lasted 14 years. Meanwhile, Ptolemy died from intemperance and debauchery and was succeeded by his son, Ptolemy Epiphanes, a child then four or five years old. Antiochus, during the same time, having suppressed rebellion in his kingdom and reduced and settled the eastern parts in their obedience, was at leisure for any enterprise when young Epiphanes came to the throne of Egypt. And thinking this too good an opportunity for enlarging his dominion to be let slip, he raised an immense army greater than the former, for he had collected many forces and acquired great riches in his eastern expedition, and set out against Egypt, expecting to have an easy victory over the infant king. How he succeeded, we shall presently see, for here new complications enter into the affairs of these kingdoms, and new actors are introduced upon the stage of history. So, this is his view of the history going through to the 13th verse. Any other questions at this time that we need to look at as far as this portion? 
Well, well, Smith doesn't address like the battle of Paneum directly. He doesn't say this is the battle of Paneum, right? Correct. But that's what he's describing. Right. Okay. And um, now there, there's going to be some things as he moves, moves through this that we're, we're going to have to see that he has. Um, we have a few different views of his because we went through this already. But as far as this historical application that he's making here, it's correct, right? That's my understanding. Right. I can't remember if there's some detail here that uh, um, they have this piece. It lasts for 14 years. Ptolemy died, right? And then he has his files. Um, and then, um, so we have the Battle of Paneum. And then there's going to be uh, Rome coming in, not wanting Egypt to be totally conquered, right? Right. So... Rome uh, exalts itself to establish the vision. And uh, so maybe maybe we could look at verse 14 now. We've got still 12 minutes. Okay. So, okay. Now, in this, this article, Smith covers verses 14, 15, and 16. Verse 14. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So, in this situation, as we are considering verse 14, we return to a point that we have, we have made multiple times in the past. Here, we have the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. Are we talking the Calzone, the Marais, or the Marais? It's the Calzone vision, right? Correct. Um, so from 723 BC to 1798. So this becomes really uh, pivotal. I mean, obviously, in lots of ways, because it's going to be the papacy coming in, the king of the north. Uh, it becomes the king of the north in this period, right? Right. And uh, so we had, th and there was some symbolism in the word uh, vision as well, you know, just because it's 2377. So we saw the 2300 days in there, plus 77 as a symbol, right? So 77 as a symbol, we could then apply as the seven times that, that symbol, 77. And, okay. and that, so, so that sort of includes the whole of the prophetic mirror as a symbol, is kind of the way that I addressed it. But if um, we take this, but, if we were to take this in the way that Hiram Edison was approaching it, would we also not look at this, that this is concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the in 723 BC to 1798. So right. we... So, we we would have the two periods of 1,260 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so Rome has to exalt itself in order to establish the Kazone, right? Because that's, that's the thing that's being addressed here in Daniel's last vision, is this understanding. But again, Uriah Smith doesn't see this. Right. He, he doesn't see the pur purpose of all of this in, in its broadest context. Now, we also dealt with, you know, the robbers of thy people. There's two different words, uh, H1121 and H6530. When you add them together, you get uh, 7651 Shiva, which is the seven times of Leviticus 26. Right. Right. So, so it's literally the sons of the breakers. Right. So that's uh, the robbers. And that, that's the word robbers. That's not with the word people. So when it says uh, the robbers, it's actually the sons of the breakers. Right? So it's two different words, which together add up to Shiva, right? It, it's pretty amazing to me. And, and of course, we just apply that to the literal application is means that this seven times, which is the whole thing that brings about this vision, right? The Kazone. So it brings us to Leviticus 26, to the four seven times, and to the Kazone, right? All within uh, these Hebrew numbers. So I, I thought that was pretty amazing. 
that, that we had that. Uh, so another way to look at the zone too is that it's 2300 days and the seven times with the two sevens, you could say that's the 70 weeks. And then we looked at the fact that two, three, seven, seven days is six years and 186 days. And that's the number of days from the first day of the first month, the 10th day the seventh month is 186 days as a cardinal count. So we, we also looked at an application of where those six years would fit in. So there was lots of different things that we looked at here. But I think the main point to look at is that Uriah Smith, again, is missing the significance of Daniel's prophecy. Right? He's, not, he's not understanding what this vision is, that it's the Kazone. Then right. that's his own being, the thing that he's rejected, the 2520. He's, he's rejected Leviticus 26, so he's not going to be able to see this. Now, if you think about it in, in the broad context within Adventism, then, because the question is always, well, what, what's the significance? Why do we need to know about the 2520? Now, now we had some discussion on this on Sabbath, and, and I've discussed it, besides, uh, you know, Sides just on Sabbath with other people. And, you know, what we see is that the 2520, you know, the question of it being a test, and I don't think in and of itself it's a test. Right. But, of course, understanding Millerite history or Seventh-day Adventists is going to be important to believe the 2300 days, right, and the 70 weeks. There's, there's going to be importance there, right? I mean, it's going to be hard to say that this, the foundation and central pillar of Adventism isn't important, right? The 2300 days in connection with the sanctuary. It's pretty important. And so this is a supporting argument for that. And so it's going to be that as Adventists, many of them are confronted with what's happening within the church. And we have to go back to the foundation of Adventism. And, and we need to understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's denominating people. Right? Part of the problem with SSA is this idea that we were going to form our own church. Right? And that's, you know, you know Parminder and Tabo uh, really pushing for that. And may, maybe really Parminder. But, you know, Tabo was all gung-ho on, you know, becoming like the head of this church you know, sort of thing, it, you know, sort of that from my perspective, he was power hungry, you know, looking for self-glory instead of the glory of God. But that's just a judgment from, you know, knowing somebody personally. I could be wrong. That's what it seems like to me. I don't like to judge other people in that sense. But, but the reality is that as Adventists, we need to understand this is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is God's denominated people. Now, we know that the institutions of the church have fallen, right? Right. And that's what right. was being tested from 1989 to 9-11. And, and we can see that the church is always willing to compromise in order to maintain its institutions. We saw that in 2017 with what happened in Russia when they started to crack down on uh, Protestant churches and not allowing them to, you know, proselytize. And, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't follow the law and they got churches confiscated. But Ted Wilson said, well, that's not going to happen to us because we're just going to comply with uh, the rules that, the, that Russia has laid down for us. So he's just showing that the church is never going to stand up for truth, it's always going to cave in to maintain the institutions, right? That's why there's really an underground Adventism that's much more real than what you see in the official church. So in Russia, there's lots of underground Adventists. Just because the official church is, is really connected to the state. Right. But anyway, you know. So that, those are the things that we have to face. Like we have to, we have to be able to see this broader picture. We need to be able to, to recognize that uh, this is a message that it's going to be understood within Adventism to some degree. 
um, uh, Kelly has some comments here, which uh, has. Uh, okay, so Kelly says starting another church is a cousin to what's happening with FSA and Canada. People no longer want to fellowship with the SDA church. Uh, the church is being redefined as the people, not the corporate church. Which, well, I don't think that the corporate church is the church. I'm not sure what Kelly's saying there. I don't know if that's redefined as the people. It, it always has been the people. Never been the institutions. The institutions are the tool of the church. The denominated people means Seventh day Adventist. That when Ella White talks about denominated, she's not talking about officially recognized by the government. She's talking about denomination has to do with the name Seventh day Adventist. Right, right. And, and if we're to call ourselves Seventh day Adventists, that includes everything Seventh day Adventist. So I, I just don't see the logic in people. Um, they're calling people out of the church in a sense that the church has become so such a mess and it is that, that mm -hmm. they can no longer they, they become guilty by association and uh, feel they feel unwelcome because anytime they try to talk about anything other than you know, the Sabbath school lesson as it presented and so on the questioning seems to be rejected it's they don't want the church doesn't want to talk about these things but it needs to uh, i don't know it, not attending church what, what, how will we ever bring the message to god's people i mean that's first oh, well, right? I, have an I, mean, to, I have an answer to that I, i'm sure you Which do and that's why i'm bringing it up that's why i'm bringing it up yeah well i'm going to deal with it when i get back to canada I'll look forward to that. Right. Yeah, because I don't think that we're going to bring the message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church first. We got to bring we got to bring the message to the world first in order to bring it to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, that, if that, I can see that being I can see that being in in the order that's needed. I'm not sure how, but yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of work church is not but basic, basic, the, the, yeah. our schools yeah. so the and all this idea, yeah so the basic idea is yeah you can never you're, you're not going to get the church to listen to you the corporate church is not going to listen to our, our message but people out there are interested in our message and if we start evangelizing Seventh-day Adventists will recognize that this message has a power that attends it. Now, we're seeing a false revival. At least, I'm, I'm not so sure about what's happening. Like in Papua New Guinea, um, they have, uh, you know, they had like massive baptisms and all of these churches uh, becoming Seventh-day Adventists. But I don't know what the spiritual condition is there. You know, if it's just a revival without a reformation. So... We can't really say, but we do know that the church appears to be operating in, in a way that seems miraculous, at least in some parts of the world. And it could be that that is God moving. I don't know. I know. I know one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, one of the main things for, what would it be called, a performance, a performance uh, mark. What do they call that again? Performance. The thing they measure performance by for evaluation employee evaluation of of the pastor's performance is how many baptisms and that the one of the strategies in the Philippines and so on is they save up all these baptisms for a year and baptize everybody at once, making it look like oh these three thousand people came to this evangelistic series and got converted but you usually they've saved them up for a while and and the other thing that you know I, I it was a year before i was baptized studied every week with the pastor and and uh i remember going to an evangelistic series the, the evangelist invited people to the back i went with a friend they sat him down it was his first night there 
they sat him down with a, everyone else that had just came that week or night and told them, make sure to bring a change of clothes and a, and a towel for tomorrow because we're going to baptize you. And I remember turning to a pastor and saying to him, they're not going to baptize him, my friend, are they? They're not going to baptize him, I said. And he, he looked at me and says, oh, yeah, they are. And he was quite disappointed as well because he was a pastor that studied with people for six months to a year before baptizing them. But that is what is happening in our evangelistic series. They're baptizing them yeah, and, without reformation. Yeah, and so we don't it's, yeah, so and often people don't stay in the church, but um yeah, I don't know what's happening in places where I don't live and I can't see it. But all I know is what God's telling me that we need to do and that uh that we, we definitely can't bring this message directly to the church because they're not going to hear. And so, you know, but we're still Seventh-day Adventists. Like, we're not going to start some new church. So I, I don't know exactly how it's all going to work. I, I think that we need to try to work somewhat within the church, though. We need to influence uh, the spiritual ones within the church, but they need to see more than us just talking amongst ourselves and studying. They need to see action. You know, it was... Uh, uh, Dave Bodwin said, well, you know, if I can use it for evangelism, then I'll see use in it, you know, what you're studying. And I, I think to some degree he's correct. We need to have a message that we can bring to people that's going to make them solid Adventists. We need to bring the truth well, instead of a watered-down message. Because if we're presenting a watered-down Adventist message and we're baptizing people, well, we're you know, searching sea and land to find one proselyte and making them twofold a child of hell than we ourselves are. Well, the the uh, one pastor that I did show it to when I was trying to study with, with the elders at the church, like he said, when I showed him the 2520, the line, uh, he, he did say he that it was very good and he wished he could use it. So what is keeping the church from using this then? Right. Because well, it does <laughs> If, if you have a lot of people wanting to become Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the 2520, and um, I mean, I'm not sure what the organized church will do, but I'm definitely certain that many pastors will see the benefit of it. Those that are spiritual will see the power that attends it. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure how mm -hmm. it's going to happen. All I know is that, that that's what has to happen. This message has to go out to the world. And... It's way too big a job for me, um, so I don't know how how that's going to happen. I mean, obviously, I'm not fit to do it, but well, you know, God, I've, I've, God's given I've, us this message. I've been, he must be accomplished it. I, I've been attending church again, probably about four or five times, and the first time in the last four or five years, even COVID, etc. But uh, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about being a member of the church again and what it would take. And, and I would have to s still stand with the 2520. I just wonder if they would accept me back as a member without disavowing the 2520. So, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Be interesting. I'll find out. Okay. Okay, anyway. I'll let you know. Close. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Okay. So our time for... Go ahead, William. I was going to say, um, you asked me the other day about the strong concordance, hard book, hard copy. Well, I found my hard copy and I looked up the Hebrew, the Hebrew, um, number four, four, seven, five, eight. And the one I got off the internet the other day was spelled different from the one that on this, um, hard copy. It's, it's spelled like A M A R. E H instead of two E's in it. Okay. Okay. Now that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Um, but the question is, which which uh, verse did the Strong's Concordance get the uh, the it wrong? Because the Strong's Concordance has a typo. It it calls one of the words vision. It shouldn't be vision. Uh, 
like, well, it should be vision, but it sh they, they have it as Mara instead of Kazan for something. The other way around, I can't remember. Anyway, if you can well, look I, into that. I will. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say the other Hebrew number was, it was um, 4759, and it's spelled with the two A's in it. It's got M-A-R-A-H. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the looking glass vision. Yeah. But we it's also look have to, right, so the 2377. Yeah, so, yeah, don't worry about that. The, the, uh, Four or five, uh, or four seven, four seven five nine, whichever it is. Don't worry about that one. Just Kazone and Mara. Just compare those. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments from today's studies? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to open your Word and to consider these points that we need to understand more fully. Be with us each today. I thank you for those that have contributed, those that have attended, and for those that will view this later. Help us now, Father, as we go through this day, that we may more properly represent your character and your name with all with whom we come in contact. Be with us now. Direct us, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.